I love oranges. <laughs> I do. They're sweet. It's the best of the juices. As a mathematician, I love oranges because they're spheres, and you can peel them in one piece, flatten them on the table, and make interesting shapes like this five-pointed star or this elegant spiral. If you put the two together, you could even make this interesting flower design. <laughs> Did you know there's a field of study that does this? Cartography. Cartographers, instead of oranges, they use mathematics to peel the globe.、Um, it's true, and they they peel the globe to make flat world maps. They've got a special word for the different ways that they flatten the globe. And、uh, this word is called projections, and projections are fascinating.、Uh, here's three of them. Now,、uh, it's a mathematical fact that projections are there are no perfect projections.、Uh, every projection has to have some sort of distortion or inaccuracy, and cartographers are always kind of minimizing one distortion or another. We're coming up with a compromise between the two. Back to my orange peel. I thought this would be a good candidate for a world map, so I made a projection based on it, and I thought it turned out pretty good. So I posted it online, and I got some comments back. Like, isn't it kind of odd to have two copies of the world on one world map? Guess so. Or another comment was. Cartographer here. I love that. On the internet, when you want to speak with authority, you say you're here. <laughs> so it's like cartographer here. I've never used an orange peel projection. I don't know anybody who has. <laughs> And at first, I allowed myself to think, "Oh, he's right. What am I doing? I'm wasting my time." But then I thought, "No, this is awesome. I had fun doing this." Who cares if nobody's used it before? And it made me realize how ingrained it is in all of us to see things in terms of practicality and utility. It's like we've got these utilitarian goggles, but these goggles make us blind to some really fascinating things. I'll show you what I mean. Here are some of my favorite projections. They're in the miscellaneous section at the end of the book of projections. Kind of like those cool misfits hanging out at the back of the class, and、uh, but a note beside each one of these is will say novelty projections, as if as if they're just mere curiosities, and that kind of annoys me because these are really cool. I mean, the Werner projection is shaped like a heart. That'd be perfect for Valentine's Day. <laughs> Something like, "You mean the world to me." Sweetie, <laughs> the Gaiu projection. The Gaiu projection. You can tile your wall like wallpaper. I'd like, I'd like to see the Winkle triple projection do that. <laughs> And then I came across this projection. This is Berghaus's five-pointed star projection. The note beside this one said, "For artistic purposes." I'm like, yes, finally, somebody has their goggles off. Long enough to realize that you can do something because it's interesting, or because it's beautiful, or for art's sake. And so that's what I want to do today. I want to talk about projections、uh, with from a creative point of view. Now you can't talk about projections without talking about the Mercator projection. The Mercator projection is infamous. People pick on it all the time because it distorts areas. This is the one that shows Greenland the size of Africa, when in reality, Greenland is the size of Saudi Arabia. Most people at this point would move on to look for a more suitable projection, but we can stick around a little longer and see what else we can see. Greenland distorts area because the closer you get to the pole, 
the more things zoom in. I want to know how close can we get to the poles? How much can we zoom in? Let's find out. People say Greenland's big. Look at Antarctica. <laughs> We're really zoomed in. This here is the Amundsen-Scott Science Station, just a few meters from the South Pole. I want to give a shout out to any uh, South Pole scientists who might be watching. <laughs> And uh, let's keep going. OK, now we're just a few millimeters from the South Pole. And this backgammon board shape, that is the snowflake at the South Pole, with all six arms pointing northwards. That's incredible. And we could keep going. But I'm thinking, why has nobody told me that the Mercator projection is infinitely long? It's because that's not an interesting thing to know that far. If I wanted to be useful, here's what I think would happen. Uh, I would make a couple of rules. OK, rule number one, north and south should be vertical, and east and west should be horizontal. I think that would be a useful rule. Uh, rule number two, let's fix that problem with the Mercator projection so that everything is equal area. Every pixel on our map is the same number of square kilometers in real life. It turns out with just these two rules that you'll get one of the most unimaginative corners of cartography. It's the family of equal area cylindrical projections. And this is a family where all you get to pick is the width of your map. Imagine you're, you're like a, a painter, and the only freedom you had was the size of your canvas. Still, that didn't stop this long progression of, of named projections over the years. Even as recently as 2002, uh, the Hobo Dyer projection was commissioned. Money changed hands for somebody to pick this width. And, and then they named it after themselves. I don't get it. And so I think maybe if you would like a projection named after yourself, this is the key. So pick a number, any number. It can even one that's been used before. Um, they'll just have to share. And make your maps that wide and put your name on it. Um, but for me, that's not very satisfying. What is satisfying is coming up with my own projections. So here are two of my own projections, and I think they're gorgeous. Now, when I say they're gorgeous, that's just not, that's not me, me bragging about myself. That's, uh, it's actually the, the mathematics that I feel is beautiful. All I'm doing is adding equations and writing a program. And half the time, I don't even know what these things are going to look like until they come out. And so I feel it's the mathematics that's beautiful. Like any good mathematician, like any good artist, I ask myself, well, what else can we do? I've been um, mapping the globe, but we can map any spherical object, like a, a soccer ball or a baseball. I think that's pretty cool. Or panoramas. Spherical panoramas are those all-around panoramas where there's imagery 360 degrees around you but also above and below. Um, that's a sphere of imagery. And just like any sphere, you can project them. I feel that um, adding, projecting panoramas adds a, a personal touch. Uh, for instance, this is the tree where I grew up. And beside it is my son's. And this really gives me a sense of um, comfort looking at this permanence and, and stability even as time moves on. And here is a bygone local landmark. It's the beloved Seagram Barrel Pyramid. I'm going to have to apologize in advance to the front row. The next sentence has a lot of keys in it. It can't, <laughs> it can't be helped. Uh, this here is an appropriate projection for this panorama because <laughs> The panorama has a pyramid in it, and the projection is based off of a pyramid. 
And the pyramid is a polyhedron. And I want to, and the next thing I want to do is talk about using polyhedrons to design projections so that we can project panoramas. I, I think I did okay. <laughs> so what you do is you start with uh, your favorite projection. So we've got the pentagonal hexacontahedron, the rhombic dodecahedron, and the deltoidal icosa tetrahedron. Don't be too afraid of these names. They're no more complicated than Pokemon. <laughs> and the, the thing you need to do in order to um, design a projection based on a polyhedron is to inflate them like a balloon into spherical versions of themselves. You can see the edges that you would cut each of these along like it was an orange, and then you can lay them out. So here they are. And I really enjoy doing these ones because it gives me a sense that every time I do a projection based on a polyhedron, it's my way of collecting it like a Pokemon. <laughs> the other thing you can do is sports balls. So for instance, soccer ball, and basketball, and they've got panels already designed for, for me to make projections. So the one on the right, I really love the, uh, the pinwheel forms, and also I like soccer, so it all kind of works out. And this one, well, this is just dynamic. It looks like a basketball exploded. <laughs> and finally, I've got these ones. These are very intricate. At this point, this is just me going crazy, actually. <laughs> At this point, I'm not even displaying the content on the spheres. It's really just an exploration of of the forms that you can get, the spirals, the squiggles, the spherical symmetry. And it really gives me a sense of, uh, it really gives me a sense of what mathematical art is all about. On the artistic side, there's really a sense of creation, like the things I'm creating are coming from me. But on the mathematical side, you get the, that enjoyment that you're exploring something that's out there. You're discovering these mathematical truths. And I really get a sense that anybody else who's playing these games and spheres and stuff like that, um, would, really, would really discover some of the same things that I have. The, the last project, like up till now, everything I've shown you is pixels and algorithms and, and equations. But I wanted to do something physical. So I started with this projection. I liked it. Uh, there's three squiggly arms. And a friend of mine here in the audience, somewhere, he said, that kind of looks like a frog. I'm like, yeah. So I drew a frog. <laughs> Using this design, my son and I created a wood block print. This is a block printing technique that um, my, my hero, the Dutch graphic artist, MC Escher, uh, was a master. It's where you take a couple blocks of wood, you carve your image on it. When you ink it up, and then you can make prints like that. And I, I, I really was very happy with how this one turned out. One of the main reasons is because I like making things that reward the viewer for a closer look. Um, for instance, I kind of imagine that if you would go up and see, hey, that's, that's a pretty neat frog. Wait a second. Does that spot look a little bit like Africa? Wait a second. And after a while, you might be able to put together that, yes, indeed, if you were to cut out this frog, maybe tuck in an arm or here and there, you could make a paper cloak. So that, that's very satisfying to me. And I really just wanted to end on, if you're in a creative mood and you're doing something like crochet or making a sculpture or putting a, a ship in a box, and... And you've got that voice in the back of your head saying, maybe I'm just wasting my time. Or maybe you've heard that backhanded compliment. Well, it looks like somebody's got too much time on <laughs> as, if they, as if they didn't just finish binge watching a season of Game of Thrones. <laughs> I want you to give yourself permission to do, 
to, to take off those utilitarian goggles and, and, and have fun exploring, even for just a second, in the name of your hobby or your craft or for art's sake. I promise you, you'll be surprised and delighted. It's going to be awesome.